change of communication here. When I got here, I realized there, were gonna, there was deaf people here. So I'm going to be using sign language. My husband will be speaking. Okay. So a little bit of turn taking here. I hope you guys don't mind. So have you all downloaded the Kahoot app on your phones? Great. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can just watch and observe. Okay. So let me introduce who we are. My name is Ken Subat, Master's uh, Education, Special Education. And my name is Leah Subat. This is my name sign. I have my PhD in Curriculum Instruction and Second Language Acquisition. The objectives that we're going to be talking about today are the IEP Cocoon, the extensive college access web, so what services are available in post-secondary education, and an allyship. Now, there's a huge difference that people don't want to talk about between what happens in high school and then what happens to those folks who qualify. There used to be a federal term called otherwise qualified. They got rid of the otherwise and they just call it qualified. Qualified just means can you pass the ACT or SAT? Okay, just come to school. Well, it's not that easy. So now we'll focus on these bullets, which you can see, and then I'll dive into them. Allyship can apply to a variety of groups, groups that are marginalized. Today we'll be focused on students with disabilities, of course. I work with deaf and hard of hearing, mostly. Ken works with students with autism, mostly. So we also have a son who has autism as well, and we have a daughter who also has a disability. And I'll dive into that a little bit more as we go forward. And so we're going to focus on how this applies to STEM, but mostly this does apply generally with allyship. People who are marginalized and being allies with them. There should be a laser here. There's Leah. There's me. There's our youngest son, our youngest daughter, our oldest son, and our middle son. You have a lot of kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're all wearing Kent, but this woman who works at Kent is wearing Colin. She looks like her kind of. Why are we doing this? I went back to school after having a career in a different field that was STEM related. Uh, got my master's in special education, was older than my teachers and everybody else. That uh, I also got my transition endorsement at the time. Do you know what the transition endorsement? There's only a few colleges in the area that offer it. Um, I taught for over a decade as an intervention specialist. I've recently changed. I'm now a work study coordinator, but it's the same, uh, same program. My, do you mind going back to the photo? Am I done? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so we, yes, we have four children. The oldest has autism, and our youngest has oldest? has difficulties, and we've adopted from the Philippines. Has cleft palate and couldn't speak until several operations, and now has some cognitive issues, learning disabilities, and things like that. So that's our family, plus the middle two children are neurotypical and have gifted skills and would be labeled as gifted and talented. Took out after me. How old is the youngest? 
28, and then 29, 33, and 35. You do not look old enough to have 35. What did you say? Oh, mm -hmm. what did you want for dinner? <laughs> I had a prior STEM career um, with the federal government, scientific technical uh, career prior to this. Uh, and then, of course, out of the four children, <coughs> as Leah has mentioned, um, two were uh, uh, individuals with exceptionalities. One received special education services in a public setting, one did not. And the reason is because he attended a private school. And we were not aware that he had autism until he was 16. I mean, I intuitively knew for years. I was trying to say, hey, guys, what's going on here? And people were saying, oh, no big deal. It's OK, really. And anyway, so at 16, we were, we had an inter I was interpreting, and I learned about Asperger's <laughs> from the class I was interpreting. And when I came home, I was like, hey, I think I found out what, what you, what's going on here. And he said, no, 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 no. Anyway, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> That's what I screamed for six years. School didn't listen to me. That's what I had. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> you can hear me. So, the reason that we're here today is that, well, me, of course, I'm an advocate for my family and for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and I have been for a long time. The community has taught me so much. And so I take what I've learned from the community and I apply it to people with autism in that community. Yay. Plus, I work with, at the university, with students with a variety of disabilities. Mostly with students who have autism and deaf and hard of hearing. And those two populations have shared with me their frustrations. It's not easy to navigate the college experience having a disability. One time, there was a student who was blind on a panel and all of the office staff was in the audience, and somebody asked this young man, who is your ally here at the university? And this young man said, I have no allies here. And then my staff went and had a serious meeting, and they said, oh, he's very, very, he's a very big Debbie Downer. That's what they said in our meeting. He's a Debbie Downer. And I said, well, he has a right to say that because our office has not been very sensitive. We provide accommodations and access, sure, but are we being advocates? Are we understanding? Not really. So that's why we're here today, because we're passionate about this topic. STEM and disability assumptions. So what do you know about science, technology, engineering, math? It's highly competitive. And what happens when things are highly competitive? The weak will not inherit the earth. It's the easiest way to put it. So if you're not good in presenting yourself and getting a point across, you'll get trampled over. It, it's very much a... a if you're brilliant. Correct. Um, unless you, you're in the right situation. Her comment was even if you're brilliant. And that's actually, that tends to be true. Um, being in a competitive field, um, you, your personality sort of has to match that competitiveness. You have to be very aggressive. If by nature you're not aggressive, or if by nature you're nice, or hiding the fact that you don't want attention because of a behavior that's seen as a, uh, if, is anyone a teacher in here, a special education team? I, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, uh, kindness is seen as a weakness, oftentimes, not by, by certain people. Uh, that's, that's the nature of STEM. Uh, and because you need to be highly motivated, um, and because of its competitive nature, there are so many restraints and constraints put on STEM um, 
that it's difficult for folks with special needs or exceptionalities to get the same uh, competitive. In fact, uh, as you guys would have seen by now, all the statistics clearly show that folks on the spectrum, students, uh, their enrollment and interest in STEM is actually higher than general education. And then when you get to college, it does this really quick. It just drops. So the rates are, I think 41% is the last number I saw. So the, and it's just because of a multi, multiple factors. So people with disabilities. People who understand disability the most are the people who have the disabilities themselves. Folks who do not have a difficult time, it's hard for them to understand. <coughs> so that's been my experience at the University. Another experience at the college level is with, with STEM students. Many professors feel that those students are cheating. For example, when you give them an accommodation, they say, oh, they've got a, a leg up. They have more of an advantage. And that's not true, but we see that a lot. And it's quite disappointing. And it's hard for the students. At the college level, we don't have enough allies. And what's sad is our office is kind of an ally. Our office is focused on the 504 laws, the accommodations, accessibility. <coughs> but when it comes to sensitivity, advocacy, understanding, it's rare. We, they say they don't have time for it. So, assumptions today, we all have them. And you all here today are allies or sons. Maybe you are one and don't realize it. Also, the assumption that coming from high school, they may have a lot of services, and then when they transfer to college, it's a big wow factor. It's quite limiting, the amount of services. A lot of students really struggle with that transition. It's worse in STEM. Those of you who have uh, students or are teachers or are familiar with an IEP, you're covered from K through 12. And if you get a referral and the school psychologist does its evaluation and you do your ETR report, evaluating team report, you can enter then an IEP, and it is an individualized education plan. So that individual has goals and objectives with accommodations, maybe modifications, that help them get access to the content curriculum. That's basically what an IEP is doing. Now you have some sidebar issues with behavior, emotional issues that are separate, but it's what objectives are, and goals are you going to write for that individual to make them successful? You have a case manager, and that's the person, the special educator, who you may or may not have as a teacher. You may, there, I case manage many students that I never taught, but I was still a case manager, and I would know what their strengths and weaknesses <coughs> are. Luckily, through the federal government, there are fairly strict guidelines you need to follow, and depending on which district you are, they either follow them well or they don't follow them so good. <laughs> and if they don't follow them so good, that's the power of being a parent, because you can use that dreaded word, due process. Everybody shudders when you say due process because they have to pay for your lawyer. And you can say, no, I'm not going to change until I get what I want. Not in a snotty way, just in a right way, advocate for rights. Um, so you have a student from, and depending, some students don't, don't have an IEP until they're in high school, some have it in kindergarten, some, <coughs> we've had students that they're seniors and they get put on an IEP. They sort of slipped through somehow. If you're on that IEP, you have a general education teacher who is knowledgeable of what's going on. And this is all by federal mandate. You have to have a school administrator. You have to have a special educator. You have to have a case manager. You have to have a school psychologist. So when you have meetings, 
It's a group meeting and it's a process. And that student knows they can go either to that case manager or someone else who's looking out for them saying, hmm, you don't do, do, so, do so good on English. You know, you, you're having a little problem here. So let's do some goals and objectives for English. And that's supposed to be embedded in your English content curriculum. Or math. Now you don't see goals and objectives for social studies. You don't. You don't see it for gym. You don't see it. It's primarily in English, written and, and uh, written and reading comprehension issues, because that affects everything else, or math, or <coughs> behavior. So you take that student that's following that's following this IEP cocoon, and they get ready to blossom and say, "Okay, I passed the ACT, SAT. Let's go." And as soon as that student's 18. You as a parent have no rights. You can't get their grades. You can't get access to the college. And the college by law will say, I can't talk to you. Well, wait a minute, we, where's that team? And still today, I talk to people, parents, guardians, and say, you know, the IEP stops. Oh no, it goes on. No, it doesn't. There's a civil rights issue called the 504. 504 is not an IEP. It has nothing to do with education. It's a civil rights issue. It guarantees your rights to certain accommodations within college. If the college can say it doesn't mess with the content curriculum. But a lot of people think, well, I'm on a that, that IEP follows me. No, it doesn't. It dies when you graduate. And if you are going on to your 21st birthday, you're probably not going to college anyways. But if you're, if you're skilled enough and qualified, used to be otherwise qualified, then that, that IEP, what goes on with you is the SOP, the Summary of Performance, which is done when you're graduating from high school. And that tells someone what services you would benefit from. It's then up, up to an accessibility department to say we can or can't provide those, those services. Will you have a case manager? No. Will you have a team? No. Will you have mentors? No. Will you have regular meetings? No, you will not have any. So moving on, college campuses. You see the web on the screen here? You can see there's some gaps in the web. A college campus is huge. For example, this campus is number one. Kent State University is number two, but still big, but quite complex for students. So when a student gets there, it can be overwhelming. I feel like, hey, what's going on? Plus, usually, colleges always are hosting uh, trends all the time. So for students to access these services, these programs, it can be difficult, it can be tough. Worse so for students with autism. For example, in the fall, I'm not sure if you saw one student with autism who's six foot nine, basketball player, was the first student with autism to be signed on a Mac school full scholarship came in the fall, or will be coming in the fall, I apologize. And now our campus is freaking out <laughs> about what they're going to do with this guy because he wants to play basketball, plus he wants to be an autism advocate. We're not ready for that. So now we're trying to come up with something and get prepared for that. But it's sad that we've had this set up for quite some time. So why don't we have more set up and ready for this student to come in and access? So this is college. And so a lot of the kids, when they come in, they're their campus peers, they might be embarrassed about having a disability, so they try to hide their disabilities. That's also unfortunate as well. 
but you'll notice that a lot of the students with autism now are much more assertive. So we're trying to set up a group for them and encourage them, well, I'm sorry, there is a group set up for them, but we want to set up more and expand it. They've been struggling with the administrators, so that's something we're struggling with. It's, really, it's been difficult. So that's not easy at the college level, to transition from high school to college. It's really not easy. So now it's time for, oh yes, go ahead. So I used to work for HEPNET2, and so part of my job at that time was working with colleges who have students with disabilities. And you just mentioned the attitude about, you know, it's sad they're not ready for this rare attitude. Uh, so I want to thank you for your attitude because so many times what we see is people who are saying, well, why do we have to accommodate this student? It's so much for us. We can't. These are the problems and a lot of negativity. So we really have to work to try to convince them that you have to. This isn't really an option. You need to be prepared for this. So it's just nice to see you. Uh, it's nice to see that from you. I applaud that. About the national deficit. So yeah, it's the same grant. Started with PEPNET 2 and it turned into NDC. So I wonder if that university could perhaps use the services from that center. So yeah, PEPNET 2 has now become in Austin? Yes, the National Deaf Center. So it's the same grant, it's the same purpose. Yes, well, our deaf and hard of hearing students, the, the population is dwindling. So, administration seeing that, and they're saying, oh, well, what are we going to do all this extra work for for just two students? When they see students with autism, that population is expanding. So now there's a lot of focus there. So we're trying to get both. You know, it's like, like a learning center. A different way of learning. We're trying to get that set up right now to incorporate all these differences. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Okay. Ready for Kahoot? Can you talk about something? I, I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but just the truth of what was talked about. Why was there interest on the campus with an individual with autism? He's fantastic. What if he didn't play sports? Or what if she didn't play sports? Or what if they weren't noteworthy? We've talked about it before, and I said, what if you're just the average student on campus? What happens in the fall at every campus across the United States? They have incoming freshman time. And what you do is you have noodle salad and hot dogs, and they play music. And you just came from high school with your whole cocoon, and everybody is gone. And you're looking at this campus that's way too loud, way too crowded. Wait, and there's nobody there. There's nobody saying, hey, come on, I'll help you. Uh, well, who's the average mentor on a college campus? A 21-year-old. I hate to stereotype 21 or 22-year-olds, but they see somebody who acts differently, looks differently, they're going, nah, nah. You, you go over with that group. Really? That, that's not taken into account. That's just my that's how it is with me every single time. Well, you're at, not in my class. At both my old school and this school, I mean, in my old school and my body school, people just hated me for no apparent reason. It would just be like, oh no, you go to that group, and the other group would just argue over me. Basically, everyone would argue over me, but they'd argue to, over me to get rid of me. Well, no one would want me, so I'd end up just not even having to do the assignment half the time. <coughs> so I'm like, Okay, it's either you accept me or you give me no assignment. No, well, that, you have to advocate for yourself. They did a science project this year, and um, he's 13, seventh grade is up last. They did a science project this year, and he got stuck with two eighth graders who were not the best students in the class. Actually, that's not true. One of them, <laughs> one of them never talked, but he was a genius, and the other one always talked, but he was a complete idiot. <laughs> so at the end of the science project, that was not very collaborative, the end of the science project, they had to bring the report home to parents and have the parents read it and mark it up before the teacher had to read 30, 40 projects. 
Also, just so, so you know, the idiot was the one that ended up trying to control everything. So, <laughs> so we read this report, and we can tell you which parts my son wrote because he wrote the way he talks, which part the other smart kid wrote, and then which part the other kid copied from Google. <laughs> <laughs> we turned the report in. Well, they, they turned it back in, they gave it back to the kids, they said, fix these things the parents complained about. And the kid who got it from Google declined, and they all got a C plus. We love group projects in our house. Because the kid's an idiot. So imagine, this is why we're trying to set something up at the college level, because you should be going to college. And people at the college level aren't ready for differences. So is everyone ready? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So here on this campus, and we're now taking it to newer campus, we have an ACE program that is a mentorship, more or less through health and social work program. We also have Active Minds, which is peers, and that kind of pays for itself, which is really nice. You don't ask for anything. There are colleges that uh, I've looked at research, the one in Arizona, you pay for the services, but it's a place you can go. I, used to, I think of it in terms of, uh, I'm dating myself. Uh, th there used to be a show called Cheers, and, and the song was where everybody knows your name and they're awful glad you came. And there are now universities saying, we're not part of accessibility services, because they can't address it. They can address the 504. That's all they can address. Here's what we le legally can do, and here's what we legally can't do. But if you have a separate agency, which is what Leah's trying to uh, initiate, a separate agency that says, do you need a mentor? Do you need help with homework? Do you need nav navigating the bank or walking through around the campus or talking to another student, eye contact, physical touch? All those things that happened when you were 18, and you're still 18, you were 18 when you graduated, and you walked, <laughs> walked across the stage, and now you're 18 in college, and you're saying, this doesn't work. In the college. Sure. I think I might have a few going so we're trying to do the same thing here. with our deaf and hard of hearing folks as well. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that the two of us, Jim Fletcher and Carol Johnson, we're from the same university. We have what's called the PLUS program. It is a four, it's a fee-based program, but we do work with students of all sorts of Where are you at? type of disabilities. New Concord, Ohio. Oh. It's about 1,200 to 1,400 students. Very small liberal arts. Where, where is your department housed? Like where? It is housed in um, Center. So you're not part of accessibility service? No, they are completely different. This Good. is the DEO over here. Okay. This is our department here. And we have all adult learning consultants who work with the students and help them learn to advocate, nice. help them, and, and uh, work with strategies. So we'll, we'll, we'll exchange some information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you for that. Okay, is everybody ready to start Kahoot? What's Kahoot? I got it right here. Oh. All right. Individuals with disabilities, IWD. Can we get any question? Okay, so do you recognize that you're working with I, individuals with disabilities and human rights issues? Yeah, 10 seconds. <laughs> Would you pick? Good job. Good craft. Yeah. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned it in a story. Yes, people who are Yes, yes, very much. They think all autistics are stupid, even though none really are. They just have differences. Differences are stupid. Is.
speaks to your intelligence that you need that sort of office. Are you able to give them do you comprehend the work, the good, bad, and ugly of this work? Uh, I took a head back this year. I think I, that's how I did it. Be hard for me to do I never really thought about it, but yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. I never really comprehended the good or the ugly, but I understand the bad. That's why I put this circle. Because, you know, <coughs> So it seems like you all get it. We we figured that much. We figured out that much. Okay, so I'm going to give an example here of a professor of chemistry. And there was a student of ours at the college. And there were several who were trying to enroll in STEM, getting involved, and not doing well, failing, because they didn't have the support. They didn't have the foundation of education in English in particular. Grammar was a problem. So then they transferred over to other fields. There was one student who excelled and will be graduating. So this chemistry professor worked with them for two semesters and did great, did fantastic. He is an ally, but didn't realize he was. To him, it was just his common sense. So this is his quote. So the opposite of that, I have interpreted several classes, and sometimes a professor will be upset with something. For example, in a math class, calculus, for example. There's a lot of writing on the board. And then to ask the professor, hey, can I stand and follow you and while you're pointing? And while you're writing on the board, and the professor said, no, sit down. Okay. <laughs> uh, another example, a professor said, uh, we, we have, we'll have a quiz during class. And I'll be signing the quiz to the students. And the professor will look at me and say, no, that's cheating. And it was, of course, embarrassing to the student and the whole class. And th that's not being an ally. That's not allyship. So this man was fabulous. So now we're going to show you a student and this student's experience. Yes? I was just going to say, you know, if he would have taken the time to learn a sign, he'd have known if you were cheating or not. He would have complained. <laughs> Maybe uh, in 10 years, he'll take him or something like that to learn sign language. Otherwise, I guess you should just trust your integrity. Are you ready to voice this video? This is one of our STEM students named Rachel. So number three, who was your ally in high school? My deaf ed professor. She's been an ally since elementary school. Uh, here, so who is, do you collaborate with? Teachers, interpreters, staff, the list is so long, so many. Is having an ally important? Yes, very important, because you don't want to feel left out, or lost, or not knowing where to go for help. I think allies are very important. For example, my projects at college, um, they'll, send, they'll send out emails to any of the professors you have for class and say, hey, you have a deaf student, there'll be an interpreter with some ex explanation for that, so that the professor is aware that there's going to be a deaf student, instead of just being taken by surprise in the moment, oh my goodness, I have a deaf student. That way they're prepared in advance. Uh, another example, when I go into my classroom, I like to sit in the front with the interpreter, but then I also have to be aware of the teacher's preferences. Some professors like to stand and lecture the whole time. 
Others like to use a board and they'll walk back and forth. So it really depends on what the professor's preferences are and my preferences, and then afterwards I can meet with the professor and have that dialogue so we can work out what's gonna be most effective and come to an agreement. I think it's important to communicate with the professor what my needs are so that we can work together, and I think that's very important. Uh, also, for example, let me think of something else. Uh, my lectures are in a large classroom, so sometimes the interpreters have a hard time hearing what a student all the way in the back of the room may say, and so they have a hard time hearing comments. And the professor is very happy to revoice the question so that I don't feel left out. So that, I, so that I can say, okay, I can hear the interpreted question and not feel left out. Instead of them just saying, oh, no big deal, I don't have to re-ask the question. So that's why I feel like allies are so important. And thank you for letting me answer your three questions. I hope you guys are able to understand. Thanks. Bye. See you so cute. Yeah. Yes? Do you mind um, sharing your name? Of course. Rachel Horky. H-O-R-K-E-Y. So, she is brilliant. Well, like, would it be possible to have her come to Ohio School for the Deaf to perhaps meet my students? I uh, really need to be exposed and see more role models in the field of STEM science. Okay, I'll ask her. I'm sure she'd be honored. When you talk about the titles of <clears throat> affiliation and allyship, the illustrations are, are sort of indicative of what we're trying to talk about. If you're affiliated with someone, you can think of unions. Unions, of, uh, pretty soon we're going to have the chaos of political turmoil in this country, and this union will back this candidate, and this union, or this group. And so they sort of, they're not connected, but they're in some type of affiliation with each other. If you're an ally, you try to pull yourself apart, there's a huge difference. There's, no, there's nothing here. If you're an ally for someone, you're connected to them. And you get a self-fulfillment from seeing them get a self-fulfillment. You know, it, it, it's difficult to put it any other way, really. Um, and if you've been in that position, um, there are days when um, you, you're going to bang your head up against the wall and say, why am I doing this? And then you go on to the next day, and it's great. <laughs> Did you jump? <laughs> yeah, I guess we're running out of time. Okay, go. Uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, a hospital consortium has a, 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 an organization called Project Search. It started down in Atlanta, Georgia. I, know, I don't know about, I know in the Akron area. And Project Search uh, simply will take uh, special education students uh, who are lower functioning, and they'll give them over the course of eight months five or six different jobs within the hospital. And they'll start out with a mentor that follows them, and then the mentor fades and fades and fades. And it could be uh, a variety of tasks within the hospital. If you're successful, they're a little, they're about 75, 76 percent. If you can make it eight months. Uh, you get a full-time job with benefits at the hospital. Wow. Um, I, I'm, I go out within the community, uh, and sometimes I'll just go out at lunchtime, and I'm driving around writing down, oh, there's, a, there's a job opening sign or something like that. And then I post on my board, uh, outside my door, all the places that have openings. Because st statistics clearly show, both educationally-wise and employment-wise, students who leave high school, who had a job before they left high school, are what, 56 to 60% more successful in work and in further school than those who didn't have work. Because at work, you learned responsibility, you learned a bunch of other things. Um, this last school year, I took a group of STEM students to Ford Motor. Uh, just about all of them, except for a couple, were uh, on, the, on the spectrum. Um, and then I took a whole group of uh, kids to a CAD-based facility uh, uh, that, uh, uses CAD machines to make horizontal boring things. Very boring, but very technical. And most of those, those guys love that kind of stuff. So real quick, 
I'm involved with everything you can see here. <coughs> so we are, we're not resting on our laurels. We're quite active uh, after our jobs, and that's how we've been working as allies. So sorry, time's running out. So what can you do? Reflect on what you already have. Reflect on what you can do. You can change your perspective. Research. You know the journals of disability studies? Are you aware of it? Are you familiar? That is where people with disabilities are writing about their visualizations for what they want to see. Think about issues of power and privilege and oppression. It's there, it's alive, and well, well is a bad word, that's the wrong word to use there. It's alive. Uh, and even with our own, even within our own people that we're working amongst and with, you'll see it. It's really bad. Do not be that person. So do you have any questions for us? Do you have yes. email? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Any other questions? Is this too harsh? No. No? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm still amazed when I go, when I go, because I, I don't, don't write IEPs. I'm a transition coordinator. And, and, but I do go to them, and I'm, I'm still amazed at how many people say, well, when we go to the local university, the two big ones by us are Akron U and, and, and Kent State, you know, we'll just take all our stuff with us. I said, why? Why, really? You have to know what made you successful in high school. That's it. that exit SOP. That's what they're going to look at. But understand, they don't have to grant you anything. They don't. They can grant certain things and say, "Okay, if it if it modifies the content curriculum, you're not getting the same degree as everyone else, and we're not going to do it." So it has, it has to actually have to be outside of that. I'm I'm surprised at how many people. I guess for me, you're still. I don't know. I'm always amazed, and this is off the point. Tell me, Sean. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in one year, I can see two fathers. I'm writing 20 some IEPs. It just amazes me. Do you mean because they just don't attend? Yep. And I do a fair amount of phone IEPs. Okay, did you get the document? Yes, send it to me, I'll sign it. It's once a year. Yes. You know, I, I work in special ed, and that's my experience too. The older the kid gets, I mean, my class is sixth grade all the way through 26. And right now it's sixth grade through ninth grade. But every year, fewer come. It depends on how old the kid is. But you know, they look at it and they say, well, I've been to 10 of these. Or they say, well, you broke the last six. We trust you. Well, the you system know. can beat you up. You get tired of it. You know, I... It's not just I'm special ed. Sorry. <laughs> it's not, it's not just special ed. The parents we need to see because the kids are struggling or the parents we never see. That's true, too. Yeah. Most of my parents are good. They're just poor. Okay, thank you all for coming. Oh, do you want to say something? Sure. Oh. On my end, I work in the college, so I'm getting the same questions. I get a lot of things that I am not able to do by any accommodation. And I think the students take it better than the parents do. <laughs> the parents are like, well, they get this, this, and this. I'm like, no, not anymore. <laughs> so that's where I'm struggling. That's that disconnect. Yeah, like extended time on homework. So now I'm having to teach what I call reverse chunking, start early, make a plan, but they don't know how to do that because they were taught that. So they don't have the other direction around. Oh, well, let me give you another three or four days. And then you end it. No, it actually needs to start in high school. And before the legs at high school, everybody's saying the same thing. If you're moving on, this is what you're moving on with. And you know that pencil and that piece of paper. Right. That's what you're moving I, on. <laughs> I've been fighting for seven years. He's had a 
his IEP is that otherwise health impaired since he was three years old. And I've been arguing for years and years and years to get it switched to autism because his intelligence wasn't the problem and neither was his health really. I mean, I took it. He missed 36 days in preschool for asthma and they were concerned about attendance in kindergarten and I got an IEP. Believe that one or not. I said, but that's not the problem. Executive functioning is the problem. And he needs to start learning that now. Yeah. Or how's he supposed to handle it when he goes to college and doesn't be able to learn coping I still learn all those things. And I still can't write without it being incomprehensible. <laughs> he should he should be a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, like I'm super duper smart, but I just can't write. Fine motor is pretty uh, rough. Right, well, right. Yeah, that's right. right. <coughs> <coughs> it's also probably contributes to me being lazy. Absolutely. I have poor motor skills. Hang on a sec. Contributes to me being lazy. History. Um, just please, I know I heard um, you allude to you know the um, the conflicts that you have in college and even in high school with um, getting accommodations and ISPs. I want to know what um, if you heard the news about the uh, admission scam where those celebrity parents and those bankers were using the accommodation system and all of a sudden their kids have diagnoses that give them a whole day to take the test and they have to prompt their own answers and so on. Like scandals like that and also the fact that in private schools in areas like Connecticut and in uh, Beverly Hills and such you have 30 to 40 percent of the students taking extended time on their on their tests and their uh, standardized stuff like that. Um, the fact that some parents are gaming things, and I don't believe this is, you know, I work with kids with disabilities and all that, I think it's really hurting the team, but I don't know what you guys are doing. Uh, like, how do you guys do that? Oh, I, I agree with you, and it's like everything. If we had a I can't give you a good analogy, but if we had a big basket of something that was free, and we put up a sign and said, everybody can partake, just take your turn. You know darn right well, somebody's going to knock you out of the way and grab more for themselves. Yeah. So some people see it as, if you're talking about like the Hollywood connections, where I've got an extra $50,000, can you put, yes, put my daughter on the rugby team yes. and, and so that she can get ahead. Yeah. And these people are basically using their whatever, wealth, privileges, celebrity connections, what have you, to gain a system that really needs to be in there. Correct. And the perception is growing in like the faculty and they're apprehensive about giving these you know, accommodations. So how do we make sure that, you know, the at-risk kids, I work with at-risk kids, and how do I make sure that they're the ones that are getting the accommodations that they're not getting now, while protecting the system from being abused by individuals like those mentioned in Spanish. I have internet doctors that are writing Diagnosis for animals or ADHD. Not sight of the just send us information. Yes, we can. Do that. I, 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 there was a, there's a wealthier school district in the area we live in, and I went to, um, I'm, I'm basically in a middle class uh, school, small district now. Uh, when I first, after I switched careers, um, I went to an area and I knew a professor that lived out there. He was one of the professors I had in school and he said, hey, go out there, take a look. So I went and the school looks like a Holiday Inn. It's ca carpeted hallways and artwork on the, you know, so these folks have money. Property tax was the great equalizer, which is not fair. It's exactly what you're talking about. I then talked to another professor and he said, don't go out there. Because every IEP meeting you go to, they've got a lawyer there. And that lawyer sits back and they say, we got our child on an IEP, because you know you can game that ETR, that evaluated team report, you can game that system. And what never shows up on any college transcripts or any application, that you were special ed, it doesn't show up anywhere. So in some wealthier sections, they're saying, put Buffy or Jody in that, uh, on that IEP so that their grades are a little bit higher, because wow. the, the perception is, you know, and I just, the, to answer your question, will you ever stop that? No, but with your, with your diligence, the fact that, that you recognize that means you already recognize it. You're already ahead of the curve yeah. as an individual, and all you can do is what you can do. Yeah. It's like in the it's sports, crazy. you can't stop Michael Jordan, but you can get a hand in his face. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you didn't do that, 
do what you're supposed to do. You know me. I'm going to talk. You know, get with like-minded people and, and, you know, create something. Create an advisory board or um, some, some way to try to combat that. I mean, you don't, you don't want to fight with people because, believe me, I fight. I don't fight. I mean, I resist, but I get it. Yeah. But how do block these every school districts in like, in, 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 like, in, like, you know, those very well areas of New York, you know, how do they not see, like, do you really believe that 40% of your students qualify for that? Do you know what I mean? Well, now that's a very tricky question to answer because the state rewards you for your special education students. You get a stipend. Now, it also penalizes you for testing results. So what you want to make sure is those students, you know, there's all kind of ways to game anything, I guess is what I'm saying. I think the best advice is you're thinking like-minded now, which is fantastic because you're a young man. Get yourself with a group of other like-minded people and simply say, we're going to keep an eye on this. There's always going to be somebody that's breaking into a house or taking somebody else's possessions or trying to shortcut their way through something. And... You know, negatively, hopefully, one day that student that gamed the system will be serving you yeah. French fries at McDonald's. Yeah, and, and, and we, need, we need to address it so that it doesn't end in a shutdown for the kids who do. Correct. Correct. You know, get with people who understand disability studies philosophy. Yeah. Because those yeah. are the people that are cutting edge and yeah. they're doing the work that we need to be doing. Great. Okay, and a lot of them have disabilities. All right. So always go back to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank Well, you're actually. Has he, have you gone through the assessment as to what you might be best at or your interest areas in? I don't like it. You want to do that really soon? Um, well, any good, any good psychologist has a whole series of. Uh, a series of I mean, you can get on the state of Ohio. Hello. Oh, that online. Well, how, what do you like? What do you like? I'm good at numbers because I know where a lot of mountains are. I know where a lot of lakes are. Well, let's see if you can comprehend what I'm going to say to you. Have you ever watched the show Star Search? No. Uh, how about the show about when people come out and sing? American Idol. American Idol. Okay, so do you think those people actually walked up on stage and went, I know I can't really do this. No, they walked out thinking, I can sing really good and I'm great. And then they come out and sing and they're going, <laughs> they didn't realize what you have to have is some sort of a neutral assessment. If you got on the website ONET Online, O N E T, it's the same exact. But I do That's know what about federal But I do know what I'm good at. I know I'm good at geography because I know where almost every single country in the world is, as long as it's not like oh, a city state, like San Francisco. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. It'll pop right up. You know, they'll have an assessment there, and it's going to be a series, maybe about 86 questions or so. No, no, no. It's a, it's a yes or no. Real simple. Okay. And eventually, it's going to be yourself testing yourself. But still, I know what I'm good at. I'm good at geography. I'm good at geography, I know. So we changed schools this year because the other school wasn't making me happy and it was going to do processing. <laughs> and I decided to move because it would take less energy. Uh -huh. And I mean, not that like, they didn't deserve it, but it wasn't worth arguing anymore. So this new school, um, in the very beginning of the year, did this reading assessment. And